Hello, I'm Eric Gutschall, Chief of Staff for the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services here at the U.S. Department of Education. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual event, Raising the Bar for Children's Mental Health. Today's event is a partnership between the U.S. Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This event will serve as a convening of state, tribal, local, and school leaders from across the nation to learn more about ways you can invest in children's mental health right now. You'll hear from school and state leaders that are successfully providing school-based services and are investing in building schools' capacity to support students' mental health. In addition, you'll also learn more about resources and next steps for states to ensure that your schools can utilize recurring Medicaid funds for school-based services long-term. At the conclusion of today's event, we hope you leave with a sense of urgency and an understanding of the important role you play in expanding, implementing, and sustaining Medicaid school-based services for children's mental health. Our kids need your action. To kick us off, allow me to introduce U.S. Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and thank you all for joining this important webinar. I'm especially glad to be here with my friend and cabinet colleague, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. And I'm also pleased that all 50 states are represented on this call and uh, territories as well. Thank you for being here. Soon after I became the U.S. Secretary of Education, Secretary Becerra and I had each other on speed dial as we worked to safely reopen our schools. And we've kept that collaboration ever since. I want to thank Secretary Becerra and his whole team for their leadership. We must model that kind of intentional partnership between education and health leaders that we need to see everywhere because we can get things done at the federal level. With all the challenges that that brings, we know it's possible at the state and local levels as well. There are a few areas where that leadership and partnership is, there are a few areas where that leadership and partnership is more critical right now than in addressing youth mental health. It's never been easy to be a young person, but right now we're dealing with a youth mental health crisis of historic proportions. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 through 14. That's devastating. We know also that people are six times, students are six times more likely to access health and mental health services if they're offered in school versus if they're offered only in the community. Six times more likely. That's a big deal. And that's why I'm so proud uh, that this administration has made historic investments in school-based mental health, especially through our work to put funding for school-based mental health services on a sustainable long-term footing by making it possible to get reimbursed through Medicaid for providing those services. So in addition to the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that put $2 billion to support these efforts, we're working really hard to make sure that there are sustainable dollars for years to come. Right now, 13 states have fully expanded their Medicaid plan to cover even more kids, including and beyond students with disabilities or students with IEPs. I applaud those 13 states. Four months ago when I talked about this, we had 13 states. Being stuck at 13 states out of 50 is not good enough for our students. We need, to, we need that number to increase dramatically. We recognize that state Medicaid offices have a lot on their plate and we recognize there can be a lot of challenges uh, collaborating among agencies that maybe in the education space, there are not people designated to, to be that champion for that Medicaid reimbursement piece. But we're talking about money on the table to help save the lives of children and young people in your states. What could be more important right, right now? I know those of you on this webinar already get this. This is it's like speaking to the choir here. It's why Secretary Vesteda and I are putting all hands on deck to make resources and assistance available to you from our agencies so you can act. We want to support you here. We want to pro solve problems with you. We want to roll up our sleeves and plan with you, with all of you. 
I know many of you will be meeting with members of my team very soon. We're standing by to help you. So as much as I have high expectations that we go from 13 states doing this to 50 states, you're not alone in this. We're going to do what we need to do to support you. And that means maybe supporting, you know, calling governors, meeting with legislative leaders, doing what we have to do to support you. You, you have a tough job already. Let us support you. So this is my ask for you. If your state is not one of those 13 states, organize a campaign to drive action in your state. Offer to support the governor with strategies to get this done. Meet with your state Medicaid director. Get state leaders for education and health together. I'm going to be very honest with you. I've met with groups of superintendents maybe four or five months ago, and I asked them if they knew if their state was one of those states, and it, very few of them raised their hands. So to me, this is an opportunity for all of us to come together. I have even talked to some governors who weren't sure if their state was part of it. So I don't think it's lack of interest. I just think we just need to connect and we need to do it together. Let's take on this youth mental health crisis with the same urgency and collaboration with which we took on the COVID crisis. I remember, you know, the first, I was a commissioner of education in Connecticut at the, when COVID hit and the health director, the, the commissioner of health uh, services in Connecticut and I, we were on speed dial. She was dealing with, you know, the, dealing with the impacts of the pandemic. And we worked closely on how to get our schools open or how to, ensure that our educators were safe and our students were safe. And then when I got to this role, Javier and I worked together to make sure that we went from 46% of our schools open to 97%, maybe eight months later, because of the vaccination distribution and all the work that was done. So my point is we need to work together and we're not setting a precedent here. We did it three years ago. We did it when we came into office here. And I think this is something that we need to meet the moment to do it here again. A few months ago, I got a powerful reminder of what it means to get this right during a visit to a school in Boise, Idaho. There I met an amazing high school junior named Becca. She told me that her life had changed for the better because of her community school. She said it was refreshing to be around an adult that cared for students and that she wanted to become one of those adults by pursuing a career in social work. Later, I found out Becca had quietly passed a handwritten letter to me through my staff. In it, she added, I felt an overwhelming amount of support that brought me to tears because the girl who was struggling and didn't have the resources she has now would never have thought this is what life could be. At the end of the day, this is why we're here, right? When we raise the bar for mental health, when we create a foundation in education in providing mental health supports, that looks different than what it did in 2019, we're meeting today's moment. And I'm telling you, we have Medicaid reimbursement possibilities that are not being tapped into. Um, we, we owe it to our students to raise the bar around access to mental health. And we wanna work with you to get there. We create hope and opportunity for more young people like Becca when we do it right. We show more students like her that they belong, that they're safe, and they have adults who care for them and support them. So today I urge you to partner with each other like every other relationship you build because we know it can change a life and lead every initiative you take like it's going to save a life because that's what truly is at stake here. I really appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, you know, it, I always say it takes a village. You are the village elders. Thank you for what you're doing and know that we're here to work with you, to roll up our sleeves, to problem solve with you. There's money on the table to provide ongoing mental health dollars to provide school social workers, school counselors, all that we know you need. So uh, let's continue to work together. And it's now my great honor to introduce a friend and cabinet colleague, Secretary Becerra. Javier. Secretary Cardona, thank you very much. First and foremost, for making this a priority at the Department of Education to you and your team. Uh, thank you for letting us be great partners in this effort. Uh, to all the folks at HHS and certainly here, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, CMS, we're really driving this effort to try to ensure that our schools have an opportunity to collect the health dollars they need to make sure, make sure their students are ready to learn and thrive. I say thank you to them. To all those who are participating in this, and my understanding is we've got really serious participation in, in this particular conversation. Thank you very much. To those of you in the education world, those of you in the 
medical health, and of course, the Medicaid world. Thank you very much for participating today. I hope your participation goes way beyond this particular virtual conversation. It's one of those commitments that will take your schools and your state to a greater level of support for our children who are desperately in need of support services for healthcare, but also mental health services. When one of every 10 children in our country is attempting suicide, and a greater number, double that, are thinking about it, and it's even worse, uh, harder, and more serious in certain communities. Our LGBTQ community is going through even tougher times. We need to step up. And so it is important to join with Secretary Cardona and his team at the Department of Education to make sure that it's clear at the federal level, we're all hands on deck. We wanna work with you and we don't just say it, we'll bring some money with us as well. And I hope there's where we can help because for us, the issue of mental health is health, period, full stop. There should be no distinction between the needs when it's physical health or mental health, and we have to make that a priority. And so it is time for us to all come together and work together on this effort. We're finally beginning to treat mental health as something that should take all of our attention. That should be uh, one where we no longer see the stigma deal more with what happens with health services when it comes to mental health than the actual need for the service. Stigma must go away. And one of the ways we can make that happen is to make sure children from the very get-go know they have access to the health care they need, including the mental health services. And of course, at our schools where children spend so much of their early life, why would you not provide that service when you can? And so that's what the Department of Education, the Department of Health and Human Services, that's what we're trying to do is make sure that our young people know when you need us, we'll be there. We are here for you and we want to help. Medicaid is a critical source of funding for school-based services, including mental health services. More and more, I think school districts are beginning to understand that. That's why we're issuing this new guidance through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, to states to expand access to school-based services using Medicaid dollars. You may be a school, you may be an educational institution, but you can qualify like a healthcare service institution to receive Medicaid dollars. That is money in your pocket to do the good work that you're trying to accomplish. Some states have already extended coverage of Medicaid school-based health services to children within Medicaid, but not all have, as Secretary Cardona pointed out. So we need states to come together to learn how they can join the rest of us in making sure our nation, nation's youth have access to the mental health and health, uh, physical health services that they need and they deserve whenever and wherever they may be. Now, we've also issued rulemaking recently to mandate quality reporting for children's behavioral health in Medicaid nationwide. That's important because we wanna make sure that as we expand services in mental health, it's quality health care. It's good services that are really gonna make a qualitative difference in the lives of those children. Because it's not just access to services that our youth need, it's access to good services. We've been putting our money where our mouth is. Just a few months ago, we announced $50 million in funding that's available to states seeking to expand school-based services. Uh, along with this funding opportunity announcement, uh, Secretary Cardona and I sent out a joint letter to governors to highlight this funding opportunity, along with other critical resources that will make easier for states to, uh, to receive, uh, to support schools providing critical health uh, care services, especially mental health services. So let me encourage each and every one of you to take this opportunity to take, our, uh, take up our challenge. Help us get to children early. Help us get them the services they need now. Help us make sure kids believe that we're there for them. CMS and HHS will continue to work with the Department of Education. Uh, we will consult with Department of Ed as much as necessary. We will provide the technical support where we can to school districts that are seeking it. But now it's your turn. 
we need you. Uh, our state Medicaid and education agencies uh, need to work together to make Medicaid funding for school-based services more available. We hope states can work together across uh, state agencies and state, Medi state Medicaid agencies to make Medicaid funding not just available, but easily accessible for your schools. We know for some of your schools, it might be tough. They're, they're already bogged down and busy enough with the resources they have to try to just do the, the basics in education. So we all have to team up together. And I know that's where our state Medicaid agencies will be critical partners in making that happen. We wanna be there with you as you partner up. We wanna make sure that it's clear that we are committed to work with you to get the job done. And perhaps the next time we meet, it'll be in person, but if not, even if it's virtual, I hope what we're saying is that we truly are treating mental health like anything else in health, period, full stop. Let's get this done. Let me turn this back over now to Eric. Thank you very much for including the Department of Health and Human Services and our team at CMS. Thank you, Secretary Cardona and Secretary Becerra. And thank you for highlighting the Biden-Harris administration's historic focus, historic investments, and historic efforts to raise the bar for children's mental health. Your inspiring call to action on Medicaid school-based services was heard loud and clear, and it has set the tone for our convening. To go further and to continue to outline why school-based mental health and prevention services are so crucial, allow me to introduce Assistant Secretary of Education for Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, Glenna Gallo. Glenna, I'll turn it over to you to facilitate a panel discussion. Thank you so much, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. I'm excited to engage in this conversation with experts from across the country who are committed to addressing the behavioral health needs of all children. I'd like to introduce you to our first panel today. First, we have Dr. Kima Joy Taylor, MD, MPH, and she is the founder of Anka Consulting LLC, a healthcare consulting company and an Urban Institute non-resident fellow. Dr. Taylor collaborates with Urban Institute researchers on a number of topics, including analyses of racial inequities in policies and services for people who use drugs, management of substance abuse exposed newborns and pregnant and parenting people who use drugs, behavioral health concerns among adolescents and young adults, and expanding and diversifying the healthcare workforce. Previously, she served as the National Drug Addiction Treatment and Harm Reduction program director at the Open Society Foundations, and also as the deputy commissioner for the Baltimore City Health Department. A board certified pediatrician, Dr. Taylor is a graduate of Brown University, Brown University School of Medicine, and the Georgetown University Residency Program in Pediatrics. In 2002, Dr. Taylor was awarded a Commonwealth Foundation Fellowship in Minority Health Policy at Harvard University. Next, we have Dr. Samantha Bodapati, who is a licensed psychologist and nationally certified school psychologist. She serves as a prevention clinical manager in behavioral health at Nationwide Children's Hospital and is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Dr. Bodapati works closely with schools and community partners to support implementation and sustainability of prevention practices in Central and Southeast Ohio. She also conducts applied research to disseminate best practices of prevention efforts and is interested in the population health impact of prevention. And third, we have Lisa Roberts, who has spent 31 years serving the students in the Boise School District in Boise, Idaho. Mrs. Roberts has worked as an elementary school teacher, principal, administrator of student programs, area director, and has spent the last five years serving as the deputy superintendent. Her appointment as superintendent of the Boise School District takes effect beginning July 1, 2024. 
Mrs. Roberts is deeply committed to building strong relationships with all stakeholders. She currently serves on the City of Boise Community Trauma Response Leadership Team, on the Board of Directors for the Women's and Children's Alliance, and the St. Luke's Community Health Board. Mrs. Roberts earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Elementary Ed from Boise State University, a Master of Arts degree in Educational Administration from the University of Idaho, and an Educational Specialist degree from the University of Idaho. She is also an adjunct professor at Boise State University. Thank you panelists for joining us today and sharing your expertise. So with that, Dr. Taylor, let's start the conversation by digging into the current state of children's health, including behavioral health. What do we know from the research about the importance of early intervention and preventative care for children? And what does this research tell us in terms of achieving positive outcomes for all youth, regardless and inclusive of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, ability, age, primary language, and other intersectional identities? That was a multi-part question. So we're excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And the only thing I would add to my bio as a pediatrician, when I was seeing patients, we actually started an adolescent clinic um, for young people and included behavioral health services. And so um, when people say, yes, it can be difficult, I hear you, but it still can be and needs to be done. And I just want to add on to some of the statistics that, that were brought forth by the secretaries and really understanding not only um, that suicide is a concern for young people, but there's different rates with um, latest stats showing the high statistics, as uh, Secretary Becerra said, in LGBTQ plus populations, but also American Indian, Alaska Native, Black teens and females, but all of the rates are going up. And But I would like to also include substance use. A lot of times we talk about behavioral health, we only talk about mental health, and really substance use is an issue for young people too. Even though the illicit rates, even the um, the use of illicit drugs has decreased and stabilized, they're more deadly because of the change of what's in that um, drug pool, such as fentanyl, as we all know. So really, this idea of um, early intervention prevention is incredibly important, incredibly necessary. None of us would be on this call if we didn't care about young people. We all do, and so really allowing for the for the um, investment in these prevention and early intervention services are going to be important. I use prevention and I always add early intervention because a lot of times um, for young people, they don't have a diagnosis, but they need services. And so I'd like to add that early intervention because often we wait and it's a it's a downside. We wait until someone has a diagnosis and we've missed the train. The train is out of the station. Um, so it's important to remember why we're doing this, because we want young people to be healthy and well, and not just healthy and well in terms of healthcare since, but for the education system, it will increase school engagement, school attendance. And we know that it's become an important metric for school systems. But also there's been research done to show how providing these services early really can impact long-term employability, impact on the, um, on the larger economy. Excuse me. So it's important to do this now. And a lot of times I go to these conversations and folks say, well, prevention doesn't work. This is simply not true. There are prevention and early intervention strategies that are incredibly effective. They're often, it's true, not, no one program is going to work for everyone. If anyone comes to you and say, oh, this is easy. If you just do X, it's all going to work out. You should be very suspect. But what you can do is start with one program. You can start with certain pieces and then really centering equity. And I, for me, it is so important to center those equitable outcomes. And those equitable outcomes means whoever your um, audience is, whoever your young people are, and you should know them, that you want the same positive outcomes for everyone, regardless, as you said, of race, ethnicity, intersectional, um, and other intersectional identities. So knowing who those kids are, centering that equity, and understanding that you need to start somewhere and then really continue to collect data to make sure that they're effective and you're having equal effect in other spaces, and if you're not figuring out how to do it. It's hard. There's this great um, study from the from um, in the pediatrics journal and pediatrician so I tend to look at that journal, but um, that looks at some of the suicide risk screening tools and where there's opportunity to not only make sure that, as um, Sarah said, we're providing good care. So what are some of the most effective screens? 
But how do you think about equity in that space? And it demonstrates there have, hasn't been enough research. So how do we put forth some of this research moving forward? This is a great opportunity for us to support our young ones who, again, as I said, we all care about, we all want these positive outcomes, and we can work together in partnership, not just mental health, not just Medicaid, not just substance use, but with communities youth and parents and others to really achieve the outcomes we hope to see because it can be effective. And it's more than a healthcare program. It's providing self-esteem, after-school programming, and as was mentioned before, caring about our young ones. Great. Thank you so much. We know that schools are sometimes a place where these health services are delivered. What role can schools play in leveling the playing field or achieving health equity? And what would it take for us to truly get there? So I believe schools have a massive role. Often in healthcare and population health, we say no wrong door. Well, if there's no wrong door, surely the place where you spend the majority of their day needs to be one of those doors. Um, and I don't, my mom is a teacher, so I do not believe that teachers have the capacity to do everything, right? And so it really does need to be in partnership with effective um, with effective uh, healthcare partners, but also community-based organizations and others. So one thing schools can do is start to build those relationships. Again, it's not going to happen overnight. There's often mistrust within communities, but start building this community, building the relationships to say, what would effective outcomes look like for you? When we put together our um, <clears throat> health base, our um, youth adolescent program and worked in partnerships with school, we had the school, the youth come and say, this is what we want. This is what we need. This is what it should look like. We need a behavioral health counselor. So how do you build those partnerships where youth are actually asking for and then ultimately working in these environments? Building that trust, honest engagement from diverse youth and parents. I have worked in government. I know you can't do everything tomorrow. But when you build trust and say, this is why we can't work with me till we can and build that true back and forth engagement, it helps make things somewhat um, somewhat more joint and successful. Funding, it was already mentioned, being able to not, the beauty of having, I think, Medicaid funding and really drawing those dollars is that the limited education and SAMS and other prevention dollars can then be used in other pots, right? And so even if you don't per se braid them, um, you are allowing yourself by drawing down Medicaid funding or allowing yourself funding for a lot of these other services I talked about, like after school, educating parents. We had we did some work with Healthy Schools campaign and the parents were like, we want to know how to talk to our kids. We want to know not just the school is, but how do we? So you have funds for things like that. Data. I think schools and this and I realize all I'm saying is tricky, right? Schools need data and need to be able to understand who their young people are and how they're servicing them. Often that data is not connected to the healthcare data. That's something that needs to be thought of and needs to be thought of in a way that's not going to create harm and not going to lead to inequitable outcomes as well. But you need to know, as I said, if we're looking for equitable outcomes for all, who's left behind and how do we partner to improve their outcomes? Um, deep CBO partnership is going to be important. A lot of times kids do not want to get services in school. There may have been histories of mistrust, but schools can still be the place where they have the understanding and resources to refer to other community-based organizations um, to understand where and how that can be effective. And then two last things, well, three last things. One, school climate. School climate, and it was alluded to before, but making sure that youth feel safe, they feel heard, they feel that it's a trusting environment. In some instances, youth are not going to trust the resources, as I said, but in others, it may be outside um, issues that are creating some of the mental health and substance use concerns. It'd be nice if school was a place, again, where they spend a huge amount of their time, a place that was safe that folks could go to where they felt secure. Um, second, evidence-informed. I was in listening into one of these health um is a health education classes. And one of the providers said, the person doing the course said, you know, there's a lot of times you can get depressed if you lose a baseball game, if you don't do well in a test. But people with depression are the ones who really wallow in those negative aspects. And you're like, well, probably you shouldn't be teaching this course, right? Because that's actually not what depression is. And now you stigmatized it in this way for this entire group of kids. And so really making sure what you're providing is evidence informed. Who's doing the work? Is there diversity in who's providing um, an understanding and education? And then the last piece that I'll say is innovators. I have worked in government. You always wanna say, well, I will do what that state does, or I will do if it's been successful in this other city. And this is a place where the folks on this call can really innovate. We don't have all the answers. Our statistics prove we do not have all the answers. 
So we need to jump into the game and work with others in partnership and innovate. Sometimes that means talking to communities who, because they felt left out, have their own answers, understanding and engaging and working with those communities to ensure that those answers and those supports are available. But then in other places, trying, if it, going that rapid data, if it's not working, trying something else, but being willing to work with our youth to create out better outcomes, even if we haven't had those answers before. Thank you so much. Based on all that you've shared, it sounds like there's still a lot of work to do, but there are different ways that a school might go about engaging families and doing this work. So I wanna dig more into the different approaches. So I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Samantha Bodapati. Samantha, your organization partners with local school districts to provide a tiered approach to school behavioral health services. Could you tell us more about your model, please? Sure. First of all, thank you so much for, for having me today. Um, at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we provide um, a number of services from preschool through high school. And so our programming can be thought of as a pyramid. So at that very top of Recording the pyramid, in progress. think about um, your more individual Recording supports stopped. that would be appropriate for a smaller group of, of individuals. So here at this level, we have um, therapy services that are provided in 45 schools in Central Ohio with school-based clinicians that are embedded within that local school culture and community. Um, and then at that and and then we also have about an average of 1800 primary care mental health visits through 17 school based 100 17 school based health clinics um, that are integrated as well into the school system and then um, lastly, at this level, we also have um, for students who have autism spectrum disorders and other developmental disabilities, our Center for Autism provides um, some on-site consultation for patients to continue to enhance some of the, the um, treatment outcomes into that school context. And in that middle tier of support, you can really think about this level as students who may be at risk for developing future mental health um, conditions. And here we provide more group-based supports and really take a skill building approach in majority of these practices to really focus on developing some of those emotion regulation skills and coping skills with students um, to be able to then kind of enact those strategies and that's provided directly in that school environment. And then at that base of that pyramid is really where some of our prevention services that are intended for all students, so your more universal supports come into play. And we take a more indirect service delivery approach to our prevention supports, where we provide technical assistance, consultation, sustainability planning, and really focus on enhancing the capacity of professionals that work within the schools, like your teachers, your educators, other school mental health professionals, to be able to take these strategies and then implement them directly in the school environment um, with students that they work with on an everyday basis. And you know, as Dr. Taylor spoke about partnerships, um, this is so important in all of these tiers, but in that prevention space, we really um, partner very, very closely with many different community organizations and agencies because um, again, we don't know all of the local communities that we work in as well, um, as well as some of the, the uh, local agencies um, may know within that particular region because our prevention services have a pretty broad reach um, outside of that central Ohio piece where our hospital is located. So in the prevention space, some of the supports that we provide are consultation to preschool teachers um, through uh, an early childhood mental health consultation program, as well as support through an Ohio preschool prevention expulsion hotline. And we also provide uh, consultation to elementary and middle schools on the PACS Good Behavior Game, which is a universal prevention model that supports children's um, behavioral functioning within the school environment. And many of these behavioral skills underlie longer term mental health outcomes. We also provide uh, consultation support to schools on the Signs of Suicide program, which is a model that really focuses on enhancing um, both children and adults within a school building's response to the warning signs of suicide and depression. And our prevention services have a fairly broad reach. So we have reached about uh, 460 different sites, and that translates to about 4,500 classrooms. Um, so it can be um, estimated that over 100,000 students have received support through this more consultative um, based model that we have for the prevention supports. 
our prevention services are also um, very inclusive of um, partnerships. And one of the partnerships that we have is with On Our Sleeves. Um, and On Our Sleeves is a national organization that develops materials for um, different adult populations, educators included, to raise awareness about children's mental health and reduce stigma around mental health. Um, and so On Our Sleeves has been a great partner in developing some practical resources um, that are widely available for um, various um, adults, including educators. And most recently, they've piloted a mental health wellness kit that is uh, that goes directly to schools um, and directly to teachers that they can use to facilitate important conversations about mental health with students. And that's rolled out in about 500 classrooms at this point. Very, very impressive. So one of the things that you talked about is that your model is providing both school-wide universal supports as well as more targeted and intensive supports for individual students. Why are universal services so important in supporting children's mental health? Well, universal services are an important part of that continuum of behavioral health services because when we can create an inclusive space and an inclusive environment um, that, uh, that prioritizes the well-being of all uh, students, then we're creating an environment that's responsive to the needs of all students. Or in other words, we're laying that strong foundation um, so that then we can better understand who it is for whom and when we actually need to then provide those more intensive or more individualized supports. Because again, we have a culture and a climate now that then can respond to um, all students' needs. And I think most importantly, we're enhancing the capacity of individuals that uh, may or may not be licensed mental health clinicians, but really prevention is for all, and that includes the adults as well. And I also think Dr. Taylor touched on um, some really, really important points around the research piece. Prevention is a great return on investment when we think about those universal services. Not only are we impacting mental health outcomes, but we're impacting some life outcomes related to like graduation, academics, um, and the list goes on. So when we invest in quality practices um, and provide that implementation support around those practices to enhance the effectiveness, we really can get a great return on our, on our investment. And then the last point here is really around that population health piece. We can have a really broad reach with universal services um, and really think from that population health lens. And like I said, engage a variety of disciplines in this process around um, providing these supports in a way that meets students where they are in the local communities and settings where they are. Thank you. Uh, what you describe obviously requires schools and the personnel at schools, uh, principals, educators, and all provider professionals to be actively involved. What does it take for schools and providers to be effective partners in this work? I think there's a couple of um, important uh, components. I mean, I think partnerships are really, really crucial um, in, in this kind of work and at all levels. So we're talking about definitely providers and schools, but it's also understanding who the champions are within particular school buildings, within the local community, who are your organizations or agencies that can really get behind this um, and how do we leverage and engage them in this more system of care approach that focuses on prevention. And then of course your state um, and national partners as well that really um, have that voice to, to continue to support these efforts. Um, but more at the ground level, when we think about schools and communities, having that willingness to think creatively and flexibly about resources. So of course, we're in a conversation today about funding. Um, and so people are thinking about funding, and which is very, very important, but also thinking about some of your very practical resources. Like if we're saying consultation and technical assistance, is there going to be staff time to do this? And, you know, a provider, what is a provider asking? Um, and then how can a school kind of be flexible to think about, you know, delivering um, on some of that time so that we can have effective uptake of these practices that we're talking about today and keeping that dialogue open around sustainability from day one. How do we sustain under what conditions is, is this going to work for you um, as a school? And how do we avoid duplicating efforts so that we're not all trying to do the same exact thing? thing, but rather that we're collaborating, working together, and leveraging one another's expertise to truly have that continuum approach that includes prevention and clinical care. Great. So you've been doing this work in districts for quite some time. 
what is your approach to measuring outcomes? And then what are you seeing in terms of those outcomes, whether academic or social emotional in schools? So outcomes are, yes, and a very important part of the picture. Data is extremely important. Um, so our approach to outcomes uh, includes um, measuring sort of at the level of what the program or the practice is trying to move the needle on. So are we talking about student behavioral skills? Are we talking about um, skill acquisition in adults and kind of picking and orienting around a couple outcomes depending on the program? And then also thinking about those process outcomes. So if we're talking about how is a system responding to a particular um, practice, we need to look at how that process of implementation is going. Is a practice being implemented with fidelity or as intended? Um, is it being integrated within to existing efforts that are already happening within the school or the community? Um, and then lastly, we want to think long term about that population health piece. And in our strategy, we're really looking at thinking about using secondary data um, around publicly available data to really look at changes and trends, but disaggregating that data so that we can really get a better picture of is this, is this working for the local communities that we're supporting and working with. So just some of our highlights from some of our prevention outcomes um, are improvements in student behavioral functioning as rated by teachers from the beginning to the end of the year in sites where we've implemented the PACS Good Behavior game, specifically improvements in prosocial behavior, decreases in hyperactivity. Similarly, our early childhood classroom consultation program um, has seen improvements in children's protective factors as rated by teachers in the areas of self-regulation, hyperactivity, um, attachment behaviors, and then our signs of suicide um, model has seen, um, well, has helped um, about 4,500 students uh, linked to or linked to referrals to outpatient care. 2,500 students have received risk assessments following the signs of suicide rollout, and 400 students have been linked with urgent immediate crisis referrals. Um, and then lastly, our school-based um, health clinics where we have integrated primary care services um, have seen a decreased need for specialty services as well as um, have, have been able to more effectively link with um, care within 60 days when it comes to psychiatry services. Great, thank you so much. So uh, Lisa, are you... It's helpful to hear about what this looks like in practice and how it's impacting students directly. Boise Public Schools offers us another look at what's happening in one community. So I know that in Boise, you are utilizing a model of school-based services that also relies heavily on partnership. And partnership has been kind of a key theme that we've talked about. We've heard about partnership, we've heard about data, we've heard about funding. Can you tell us about the full service community school model that's being used in Boise, please? Absolutely, and it was fabulous to hear Secretary Car Cardona talk about meeting Becca, who is a student at our alternative high school that has a community school. Um, we have six community schools in the Boise School District. Five of those are at elementaries. We have um, about 23,000 students in the Boise School District roughly 50 different schools. And in the last few years, we've seen a major decrease in our percentage of free and reduced um, lunch students. But what we have seen then is the families that are in need are at a much greater need than we that they'd even have previously. Um, and so we do rely very heavily on partnerships um, in order to fund our community schools. And we made a very concerted, concerted effort that we wanted to be able to versus using a lead agency, we wanted to be able to fund um, our community schools so that they would be sustainable in a long-term you know, st strategic um, way. And so currently we use Title IV funding um, to pay for a strategic partnership coordinator that we have that's housed at kind of at the district level. And then our community school coordinator salaries and benefits are paid out of Title IV as well. Um, we use Title I funding to pay for um, parent engagement activities and then we have an amazing, robust Boise Schools uh, Education Foundation. And over the past eight years since we started community schools, they've roughly spent about a million dollars helping stand up and helping to support our community schools. And sometimes that looks like paying the salary of a new community school coordinator for a year until then the district can take that on. Um, we have over 100 active partners, um, nonprofits, business, government, faith-based organizations, 
Um, we have a food pantry, this Idaho Food Bank. It's at every um, one of our schools. We have a mobile medical unit. Um, and then Parks and Recreation, the Boise City Parks and Rec, Rec they um, have, they offer some, some for, but after school care at all of our community schools, which is a huge partner. So the foundation of community schools in our district um, really created a very unique experience for us this last fall. We truly had a mental health crisis in our district where we had a cluster suicide, um, uh, a suicide cluster. And because of all the amazing partnerships we had, we were able to rely heavily on the community to help us with that. Um, to the point where the, the Boise City stepped in and they created a trauma response team that we're part of. Um, St. Luke's, the health system, they're part of that. But I truly believe without that solid foundation of all the partnerships we have in community schools, our response would have been much different this fall. So that really did make a huge difference for us. Thank you. Uh, you really focused in and narrowed in on partnerships that are happening within the Boise School District. What partnerships do you think have been the most impactful? So I would say our partnerships with the city. Um, we also have a partnership with a group called Communities for Youth that has been helping us gather data around student mental health. Um, St. Luke's Health System has just been a tremendous partner. But then we also um, partner with outside mental health therapists to come into the schools. I know that's been talked about a couple times in the panel already about how important it is to meet the kids where they're at. So we have um, 30 schools now. It started with our community schools, but we now have um, mental health provider providers who come in to 30 of our schools, 16 agencies, and at any given time, 200 students are seeing therapists. Um, they, the, all those agencies are responsible for doing their own billing. Then our foundation helps stand that up if they need help with a copay or you know what that might what that might look like. Um, I know as a principal, I would have a student that might need some mental health services, and if their appointment was at 10 o'clock in the morning, I may not see them until you know, the afternoon, or maybe they'd come to school and then once they went to their mental health provider, they wouldn't come back for the day. So I think it's those mental health therapists, like I said, in the local um, health systems that have made such a huge difference. The other partnerships that I think are really important for us are those partnerships that tie in specifically to parents. So we have a great partnership in the Boise School District with it's called um, Learning Lab, and they teach uh, English classes to many of our parents. We have a lot of refugee families in our school district. So that has also been truly um, a way out of poverty for a lot of our families is through those, those classes they're taking and then being able to find jobs. Thank you so much. Doing this work and implementing a model like a full service community schools can be transformative, but it's not always easy. And I think the way that you kind of just rolled into, you know, here are all of the things that we're doing does make it seem like it is easier than it is. But what are some of the things that were required of the school district when adopting a model like this? And what do you think caused you to be successful? Like, what does it take to be successful with the model? It's an excellent question. I, and I'm going to tell you, we made some mistakes when we first started. So um, when we first started, we studied, we visited Vancouver School District in Washington. Um, some folks also went to see Promise Neighborhoods down in Salt Lake. We went to community school conferences. Um, we studied different models around the U.S. And then this is the mistake I would say we made was we chose four different schools in our district to be community schools and to adopt the strategy. So versus having it kind of come from the school level to us to say we're ready to do this, we were like, you're ready to do this. And so since then, we have that's the two schools that have come on since the very beginning. That was very much a school staff um, led initiative. And I think that does make a difference because you really have to make sure that a school truly believes in a hand up and doesn't believe it's going to be a handout, um, that they understand that they're, especially in the beginning, it is going to be a little bit of a heavier lift. Um, you really need to have teachers at those before and after school events. You have to have teachers, you know, being bought in. They can't, there can't be a feeling that Community schools are all about that community school coordinator, and they're the community school coordinator is pretty much the one that does the community school thing. It truly is the whole um, school population. 
And it means that, you know, that your principal and the school nurse and the community school coordinator and the social worker, um, that type of a team has to meet on a regular basis to look at ad addressing needs like chronic absenteeism or um, other issues, you know, that might be happening with a family. So I do think that we've figured it out now. And um, as a matter of fact, we have a school right now that's kind of in that learning phase. They're learning more about it. They're, they're looking at what they think they would want to do as a community school. And then once we have, matter of fact, we're uh, developing a rubric right now that once they've met all those different pieces, then we would look at bringing them on as a community school. We did a study a few years back on what schools probably would be the best ones to bring on next if they were ready and if they wanted to. And of course, it's based on, um, you know, free and reduced lunch percentages, on the um, mobility in those schools and on a, you know several different things, but it really does have to come from the school. And the difficulty with that um, is when you change principals. So you know you might have a principal that's retiring or a principal that's moving on to another school. Well, when you bring in a principal, and we haven't always done a great job of making sure that we truly educated the new principal on what community schools were, um, you know what it's all about. You have to have that principal buy-in, you know that complete buy-in and belief in a community school. So we're continuing to learn and to get better um, as we increase, you know, our um, community schools across the district and increase our reach to students across the district. Thank you. Uh, you know, I just want to take a moment and reflect on, you kind of talked about that, that need for there to be buy-in across the school. And we heard earlier from Kima and Samantha about the fact that it needed to happen across all personnel right? Not just with the educators, not just with the administrator, not just with the families. And Kima really talked about that coordination between, you know, doctors and health and schools. So I think that this is a really nice way of looking at that whole system all together. You talked about some of the mistakes that you've learned from, but what are some of the successes that you've seen? So I do think we are always striving um, to get past the, um, you know, basic needs, providing basic needs to families. Because I think that's a really easy, fast way to get families understanding kind of what some of the things are that community schools can do. But I don't ever want a school to, um, to downplay that piece of providing those basic needs because that gets families in the door. And then once you get families in the door and you can figure out why are they struggling with food? Why are they struggling with you know, clothing, you find out, well, maybe they don't speak English in the household and the parents can't find a job. So those would be the, some of the main successes I would say we've had is being able to work with a family, get them English classes or help them fill out resumes, help them find the appropriate wardrobe to go and interview and to practice interviewing um, so that they can get a job. We have numerous success stories about parents, you know, finding a job. We have a head custodian in our district. She started off you know, at one of our schools without any English, she became a custodian and now she's a head custodian. Um, she's just been able to move into her own home with a backyard. Um, her kids are loving that. All of her kids have their own room. That's a huge success. Um, also, I would say another success is the chronic absenteeism piece. I know that before um, the pandemic, we had about 5% chronic absenteeism and we're experiencing about 11% in our district now. So that team that can drill down and really dig in and figure out why is the student chronically absent? What does the family need to get that um, student to school and what support and, and help can we get? So I think there's just all different examples of us breaking that cycle of poverty. And then we have another family at one of our schools that um, through English classes, was uh, they were able then to open up their own uh, market, their, their own ethnic market. And they, a matter of fact, they just um, catered one of our community school meetings we had with our foundation um, a few months ago. And so they're seeing a huge success and now they're giving back. Um, another example of, uh, so, so again, with our learning learning lab, the um, English classes, the it moved sites. And so uh, there was a, a gentleman that had a van and he was willing to help some of the other ladies get to the classes. Well, None of them spoke the same language, except they were all learning English. So in order to get to, um, you know, their their classes and ride together and communicate, they were able to use English that they just learned. And that was pretty impactful and pretty amazing to see. So those are just a few different examples of um, 
what I would call success in our community schools. Great, thank you so much. Thank you uh, everyone for your insight. We do have a few minutes left to address some audience questions. And so I have some questions that we received from attendees when they registered for today's event that relate directly to what we've talked about today. So I'm gonna start off with uh, Kima and Samantha. Um, so can mental health and behavioral support be incorporated into early childhood settings? And then is this something we can do for all children, regardless of age? So Kima, do you mind going first? Sure, yes, yes, yes. Um, and I think that's important. Um, Georgetown just put out a um, paper that, that talked about providing these services from infancy, right? And in and, and the dyad, but really well-being and mental well-being can start from birth and should. And if I had my dream, we're just going to go there. You know how you can't go to school unless you have an immunization card filled out, right? Certain, I would love, and a, and a physical, I would love for you not being able to go to school without um, having your um, immunizations, your physical and your mental health um, survey. And not that they need the results necessarily, but showing that this is as important um, and just having yearly check-ins. But yes, absolutely can be and should be incorporated into early childhood settings. Um, and and should be, I mean, as Samantha was talking and I'll let her talk further, that's that universal part, right? Mm -hmm. And all of us, not, I, I feel all of us can use support. Some people have the luxury of having support and can pay for it or have it in their outside world or other spaces. Um, but this is a space really starting from, from infancy. And PEDS, you know, we do. We do developmental screens, these other pieces. So it should be offered. And Medicaid can cover some of that too. Thank you. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I will just add that. Um, so our early childhood mental health team that I spoke a little bit about the classroom consultation work that they do, they have um, active prevention efforts um, focused on uh, prevention activities with families, like the positive parenting program, where they're providing these services directly in various community spaces, um, as well as kind of take that birth um, on approach, and as well as having some, some clinical um, programming to provide um, supports to families um, in that early childhood space. And I really think one of the keys when you think about early childhood, right, is, is yeah, how do we engage um, the family, right? Because obviously we're not doing as much direct work, but it's really more about that family piece and really thinking about um, how do you engage the family and provide that that right level of support? So yes, absolutely, there's so much that can be done. And I, and I will just add that the research would suggest that that should be the direction um, to go as well, right? Because you're gonna get your longer term outcomes um, when you have those quality supports um, really early on. Great, thank you. So for the next question, Lisa touched on this during part of her presentation. And so Lisa, I wanna give you an opportunity to talk about it a little bit more. And then I wanna see if either Kima or Samantha have anything they wanna to add to it. But can you talk about how states or how funding can be used for community partners integrating mental health into schools. So you had talked about like some foundation funding as well as some title funding, but is there anything else that you wanna highlight about funding that you've utilized in place of Medicaid for some of these services? Yeah, so I, I think definitely Title IV funding has been really important for us. We also um, do have a different, we, because our district was um, developed before Idaho became a state, we have a little bit of a different taxing um, authority in our district. And we always try to look at those funds that we get for that because other neighboring districts don't have those same types of funds. We try um, to make sure that we use those funds specifically for programs or initiatives like the community school strategy. So we're able to use some of that funding for our community school strategy as well. For example, we've also used it to greatly increase. Um, Idaho doesn't uh, give any funding to for pre-K unless it's early childhood special education. And so we've also used those types of funds because we know, and I'm glad we talked about that here, if we can start working with these students at, you know, four, at ages three and four, that'll make a difference as well. Um, I know a lot of our districts around us use um, grant funding from United Way, which I know that Secretary Cardona was here in um, late November and awarded uh, the Treasure Valley United Way a large grant. And I know that they're going to be expanding rural um, community schools in, in a lot of our rural districts. 
But um, for us, it's been mostly, like I said, through um, our Title IV funding, our taxing that we were able to do. And then um, our foundation is truly amazing that um, donations they receive um, every year to help stand up our community schools is pretty phenomenal. But our foundation director does a great job of telling the story of community schools. And so the people that are looking to give, they really understand how impactful um, their money is to our district. Uh, Kima and Samantha, anything that you want to add on this before I go to the next question? I would just add with funding, um, you know, as an external kind of entity doing school-based work, um, it, we uh, certainly um, get uh, wonderful um, support from our hospitals foundation um, and our leadership is certainly very invested in, in some of our school-based work. Um, and then we also get uh, funding support or, uh, with different grant activities through state departments um, and other types of, of grants, um, as well as are able to raise some funding with some local organizations. So to continue to, to support this work. Well, I would just add, not that it's always done, but SAMHSA, right, gives prevention money for mental health substance use, thinking creatively in their strategies. That's an FQHC doc, and so often if you partner with FQHCs, just because of the differential in their Medicaid reimbursement, can offer often broader support services if they offer um, quality mental health services and a lot of the school-based health centers are through FQHC, FQHCs, but even when you're thinking of referring to communities, um, and often when you partner with them, a lot of the funders, private funders see that as an advantage. So just thinking creatively and, and kind of doing what I always like to do, and which we did for our um, adolescent clinic was kind of follow the money and like map different pieces of money that you then often, it's that partnership, right? Then have to say, well, what are we currently doing in our state with the SAMHSA prevention money and how can we use some of this for school? Great. Thank you. So how are we bridging the gap between individual for individual services for students in schools and family support services outside of schools? We know that schools keep doing more and more and more. And from a treatment perspective, we know that treating the individual while neglecting their home environment is not effective. So for each of you, can you share how your district or the work that you've done is connecting with families to ensure that their needs are met as well. And um, I don't know who wants to start, but it's a question for each of you. I can go ahead and start really quickly. Um, so that is something we've also, I feel like gotten much better at these last few years um, through our strategic partnership coordinator. Um, she works directly with schools and talks to parents about what do parents want to see. So for example, this year, one of the, um, the classes that we discovered, parents were having a hard time navigating special education. We did a special education 101 um, workshop in the evening for them. Um, because of our uh, really traumatic fall experience with this cluster of suicides, parents were clamoring for more information about the signs of suicide, about mental health supports and services they could provide their students. So across our district, we've done several different workshops for that as well. Um, and I, you know, I talked about, of course, a lot of the basic needs um, that we are able to um, meet for families. And that, and I do mean for families. So it's not just getting, you know, food pantry and um, Get, get in the access to the food pantry. It's not just getting clothing for the student, but I mean, there's times when truly we're getting bunk beds for the family because they don't have bunk beds or a kitchen table. One of our local um, real estate companies that was, you know, staging homes, they donate a whole bunch of the leftover furniture from staging, um, from home stagings. And so we were able to get families new furniture in their house. Cause it's like you said, if the, if things aren't going okay at home, they're not going to go well at school. So we, we do work hard to reach out to the family to determine exactly what that family's needing. Maybe they need the, the parent needs a referral for medical care. And so then we can help them, you know, hook them up with a medical provider. Thank you. I can go next. I don't think we're doing a great job of bridging with parents, but one thing, as I mentioned, I'll mention this from a work I do, but also as a parent of teenagers, um, a couple things. One, we're not educating parents. Like when we did some focus groups, parents want to know what is the true science between 
around mental health prevention? What is the true science around substance use? All of the stigma that all of us have been, um, you know, stewed in, they have the same questions. They're coming from the same places. The, the inequities I mentioned around um, LGBTQ+, around American Indian, Alaska Native, we don't make sure we're integrating and talking with parents in culturally and linguistically effective ways for them. And that's regardless of socioeconomic status, right? It's, it's all kids, all parents, all families. So I think we do need to do more work and the conversation, which is really hard around um, when we can't talk to parents, right? So you can have these discussions with young people and their parents don't know about them. And making parents feel comfortable, educating them on what those services include on a global level before it occurs to theirs. Because otherwise it can create this rift, like what are you doing to my child? What's going on? And, and it creates um, unnecessary trauma when you're trying to work in partnership for the person to get help. And I would say as a parent, again, we don't, get that. And sometimes I, you know, and again, it's regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of race, ethnicity, all of those other pieces, but those pieces do have a different component that really need to be discussed and understood with parents starting from when they're young. So in elementary school, these are the rules, like as a pediatrician, you say at 13, I'm going to start having conversations with just your child and your child, you know, can decide what they're going to talk about, but this is why you start telling that parent early so they don't freak out at 13. But we need to kind of do the same thing with these situations. Thank you. That's a, a great perspective. And I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that in. Samantha, uh, what are your thoughts on this, right? How do we connect with families? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, and as I sit and listened um, to both of our other panelists, I certainly agree with um, a lot of what is being said. And you know, I would just add that, you know, for us, it, it really kind of depends on, on the particular program, but I know in all of our more school-facing efforts, um, we've certainly made um, a lot of efforts to try to say, okay, this is what we're doing in school. Now, here's kind of the, the, the parent version of this. And um, and I think it just, it depends on the local community. You know, I know, like, I um, ran some workshops, right, where I, at the end of the day, we have a lot of parents enroll, and then they're um, not there. And then we're kind of spinning our wheels to say, well, how do we better um, engage this this particular group of parents? Um, and so it just, I think it depends a bit on that piece. Um, and then I think about some of those broader um, materials that are available, like I know I mentioned on our sleeves. Um, those are some really great resources for parents. And so getting just um, at a very broad um, level, getting some of that, those resources in families' hands to kind of raise the conversations around mental health, what might be happening in schools, um, and then trying to continue to, to fill some of those gaps around um, kind of making that home and school connection happen. Um, it, it's been really kind of program dependent and regional um, dependent on the region and the particular school um, system that we work with. So I think um, both panelists raised some really great points around continuing to kind of develop that piece. And, and we're very much in that same boat. Thank Can I you. just add something to something Samantha said, which I think yeah. was so key. You reach out and you do all these things for parents and they don't come, which is true. I've been that parent, but because parents are exhausted. Right. We're talking about school systems that are exhausted, like everyone's just exhausted. And so finding creative ways to like asking parents, how do you and how can you engage is going to be really important because we do these. And I'm in the same boat, Samantha, you do the best put together kind of parent outreach things and no one shows. And you're like, what? And, and you don't you can't give up. Right. You can't say, well, we try. It's like thinking as Samantha was saying, like that next step. OK, what do we do differently? I uh, I had similar thoughts, Kima. Uh, as a parent, um, I thought there are things that I need to know, like universally, right? When we think about it, the universal tier, and then there are things that I need to know in a moment of crisis, right? At the the targeted tier, or um, and so how is it that we really think about the the variety of activities that ne that are needed and create a plan so that you have the resources there in the right amount of time. Um, that really make an impact. Uh, thank you to each of you uh, for joining us today. And I'm going to hand this back over to Eric to move us to the next discussion. Well, thank you, Assistant Secretary Gallo. And thank you to all of our panelists for outlining the need and value of school-based services. So now that we've heard about the importance of delivering these services in a school-based setting and about how positive their outcomes can be, Let's learn from state Medicaid and state education leaders on how they access Medicaid funds for these services. 
So to facilitate this panel, I'd like to introduce a key leader in this work, Kate Guinness. She serves as Senior Policy Advisor for Children and Youth in the Office of the Center Director at the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services. Kate? Thank you so much, Eric. And I am um, delighted to be here today to talk more about this. Um, and grateful, frankly, for the um, collaboration with the Department of Education. We um, have been spending a lot of time together really trying to do everything we can do as federal agencies is um, to collaborate in order to make things um, easier for states and therefore easier for um, the kids and their families to get what they need. Um, and I think uh, having uh, Secretary Becerra and Secretary Cardona kick us off today was really um, indicative of the work that we've all been doing together and just have have uh, gratitude for that. And what you'll see in the panel that's coming up is that we actually have two states uh, represented. We have uh, New Mexico and Kentucky, and I will I will introduce our speakers shortly, but you will hear from each of them from different perspectives within their states about the importance of the work that they have each done and the work that has been done together um, in order to uh, move things forward with uh, school-based services um, and with the work they're doing in Medicaid. Um, so um, I will uh, begin, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll begin by introducing um, Erica Jones, who is the Maternal and Child Health Branch Manager for the Kentucky Department of, for Medicaid Services. She oversees school-based services, EPSDT, which is Early Periodic uh, screening, Diagnostic, and Treatment Services, CHIP, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program, and Prenatal and Postpartum Initiatives, among other programs. She has nearly 20 years' experience in healthcare policy. She's joined from Kentucky by Eva Stone, who is the Manager of District Health for Jefferson County Public Schools. Eva has worked in school nursing for 22 years, where she's experienced, she has experience supervising nursing and developing innovative nursing models. She holds a BSN from West Virginia University and master's and DNP degrees from the University of Kentucky. In 2023, she completed a postdoc fellowship with the Helene Fold Health Trust National Institute for Evidence-Based Practice in Nursing and Healthcare. Um, and then from New Mexico, we have Liza Tingley, um, who's been a Medicaid school-based services coordinator in New Mexico for the last 12 years, and currently she works for the Las Cruces Public Schools. Prior to working in Medicaid school-based services, she was a school nurse for 11 years and worked as an um, operating and recovery room nurse for 16 years. She's an active member of NASN and NMSNA, which are the school nursing associations, and served as a member of the National Alliance for Medicaid and Education Leadership Team for four years. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, Christy Gwynn has been the Deputy Bureau Chief of the Exempt Services and Programs Bureau of New Mexico's Human Services Department, Medical Assistance Division, since November 2021. She holds a master's degree from New Mexico State University. She was the school health manager for nine years and also spent six years as a district level coordinator for the Medicaid school-based services program. Her role includes oversight of the New Mexico Medicaid school-based services program. She's also served in various positions on the board of directors for the National Alliance for Medicaid and Education, including as president in 2019. She's currently the named government affairs committee chair. And again, we're grateful from both states to have um, Medicaid and education folks, and also um, just a shout out to the strong nursing presence. Um, we know that nurses um, are critical in school buildings and um, that in fact, in many school buildings, they are the first line and often providing a lot of behavioral health support to the students in that building or sometimes in two buildings or three buildings. So we're really delighted to have um, to have your uh, professional expertise as well as uh, as well as your current roles um, and speaking from those. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, and what I will say is that um, the we put this panel today together today um, to really think about once you have a, a school based services spot once you have expanded 
Um, what do you do with that? And how do we think about the opportunity that, that having an expanded school-based services um, state plan amendment and Medicaid, how do we think about the opportunity that that affords to the state and um, the students? And so um, what would be helpful first, um, Erica and then Christy, from your state Medicaid perspective, can you talk each about um, the story of why your state expanded, what led the state to expand, um, and kind of where you are currently um, in terms of the expansion. That'd be great. Um, and maybe we'll have Erica first and then Christy. Thank you. Um, in Kentucky, we've recognized that schools are an ideal setting for delivering health services as the schools have hours of direct contact with our children each day. And over half of Kentucky's children are Medicaid eligible and school-based services improve access to care while reducing burdens to families, um, particularly the need to take time off from work um, and also getting transportation for appointments. And so with that in mind, we submitted our state plan amendment and it was approved in late 2019. Um, we had an idea for a robust rollout of expanded access, but with the pandemic, um, we had to change our plans. Um, however, the pandemic did highlight the growing need for mental health services for our children and also the necessity to improve access to those services. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, and Christy? Yeah. As, as we looked to starting to implement, we, of course, were not early implementers of the free care expansion. Uh, but as we moved forward, based on feedback from not only our Department of Education, but the office of our governor, uh, the request came in the middle of the pandemic. And so that was not, of course, an ideal time to try to kick off the recare implementation, but we persevered and moved forward. We were able to convene the group of stakeholders. We, you know, called on as our second largest district to participate. We immediately joined with the Healthy Schools Campaign and their learning collaborative because one of my big the wheel is we were moving forward with this. We take those lessons learned from other states that had gone before us and move forward, you know, as quickly as we could to determine how to best serve the needs of the population of our state. I think a couple of the things that were really challenging as we look at this, and well attest to this, when the guns first came out in 2014, our nurses were all over me to start the expansion process. But one of the things that was really hard for us to do was to quantify the volume of services that were out there. So we know that there were services being provided to our general education students that would have qualified, but trying to quantify what that volume of services was, was challenging. And then as we started this work in 2020, 2021, with other school districts, we started talking about behavioral health services. We found it more difficult to quantify that. So the nurses have a lot of reporting that happens to state. They can tell us how many bids they have for asthma and diabetes and epilepsy and so forth. But our behavioral health services that were being provided to those general education students were really not being tracked hardly at all. You know, they, the districts were providing those services, the providers had on paper because there was no billing component to it. Documentation was very piecemeal and the districts really had a hard time with that. So when we started talking with our state leaders, one of the questions that they kept asking me was, how much is this going to bring in? And I was not to give them any data. I couldn't tell them we were going to make an extra four, six, ten million dollars a year. We had no idea what this was going to look like. So we moved forward with the expansion. And we know we were able to do so with the states are working with fighting that's really essential in that process. Because as a state agency, I know what what has worked in my state, I know what my state needs. 
but it's really hard to meet all of those needs for the CMS documents. You know, you have an implementation plan, a state plan amendment, and so forth. How do we write good policy in order to move this forward and meet everyone's needs and identify how to do this and maximize reimbursement for the schools? Because that's our ultimate goal. Thanks so much, Christy. And acknowledging you went out a little bit, um, we know that you are in rural New Mexico, but we heard pretty much everything you said and, and very helpful to kind of hear some of the some of the challenges for um, sort of that that you all are thinking about in terms of what um, is going to optimize things for schools. So that's very, very helpful um, um, for us to hear. Um, and I'm wondering, um, one of the things we talked a little bit about um, was the particular um, need in New Mexico to engage um, the, the tribes and the American Indian population there. Can you speak a little bit of, um, about that as well? An apology is a connection. So New Mexico has 23 Native American tribes and pueblos. Uh, so a vast population um, across the state. They're not all clustered in one area. So many of them do have schools, particularly elementaries, that are funded by BIE, but the majority of their students attend our public schools. And so we're still able to meet their needs through the public schools. The BIE schools are eligible to participate in our program, and we do have a couple that do so. Uh, but one of the things I think that is really important that our schools are hypersensitive about is the cultural awareness and acknowledging that there are diverse needs within these Native American populations, especially when it comes to the mental health and behavioral health service. So I think our LEAs do a really good job of being sensitive to that, identify those specific needs. You know, for example, if they have a death of a tribal member, you know, those um take it to their final resting place. I mean, if we could hear about a student who passed away on Friday, and but by the time they come to Monday, services, funeral has already occurred, that individual has already, has already been put to their final resting place. And so our school providers have to be really sensitive to those kinds of, con of considerations to be able to meet those needs of those students. But I think they do a really, really good job of understanding that. We have many tribal providers who work in the schools, you know, those those areas who have Native American population, if they can get a tribal person to come in and work, you know, they're licensed practitioners as well. If they can get somebody who better to with those individuals than somebody who is who is from that area, who is from that tribe or Pueblo to come in and work with those individuals. So I think that's something we're definitely, you know, very focused on and and want to be sure we meet those significant needs as well. Thank you so much, Christy. That's really helpful. Um, and sticking with my Medicaid colleagues for a minute, um, we know that the state plan amendment, um, and we we have interchangeably been calling it, <clears throat> Christy called it the free care, um, making the free care change. I referred to it as um, the expanded school-based services spa. Um, we've been we've been trying to transition our language a little bit to say what we mean, which is why you'll hear me call it the expanded school based services spa. But for those of you who've been doing this for a long time, that's the free care spa. Uh, um, so um, we know that's sort of the essential first step. Um, but a lot of work um, goes into that and that folks at CMS work very closely with states to to get those um, spas approved. Um, but we know that once that happens, then there's an implementation plan, um, and there's a lot of work to get engagement at the local level. And can you, um, maybe Christy first and then Erica, can you talk about your efforts to engage with the local education agencies um, to ensure broad adoption? And I think each of you has a bit of a different um, approach that has been taken, but or that is being taken. Uh, but it would be helpful, I think, for uh, colleagues on the call to hear really how you have gone about about that work. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really unique to New Mexico is we have 
virtually all of our LEAs that participate in the program. So there are 89 school districts, 87 of them currently participate in our program. And I cannot even attribute that to the expansion of Medicaid services. Stay back. Settlement in 2015, 2016. So that time, you know, we talked with our LEAs about the changes. I mean, and we're, this is something we really focus on in New Mexico. We have quarterly meetings with, to share changes in policy and program. And we're, so we're actively engaged with them. And so back when we first transitioned to cost settlement, many of participating in the study. And as we all know, you know, that the methodology for cost settlement requires participation in the time study. And so at that time, we just started encouraging the LEAs to take full participation and participate in all of the claiming, including administrative claim. And it took a couple of years, but we got all of the LEAs on board so that by the time free care, you know, and this expansion rolled around, all of our LEAs were already participating in the time study. That means they are all going to get the benefit of claiming for the expanded services based on how the cost settlement methodology works without even submitting claims. And our, our state plan amendment does not have a requirement that claims have to be submitted. They just have to be documented and you have to be able to prove that in terms of an audit. So our LEAs have all been participating last year and we had over six million dollar increase in our federal funding in our first year for for the expansion services days were hesitant to start submitting those claims for those expanded services and so i think as we continue to move forward into years two we're in the middle of year two now and, and into year three we will see additional schools start the claiming process they've been doing the documentation and we so we ensure documentation is there for services, regardless of if a claim has been submitted. But I think we'll see additional schools start to submit more claims as they get more comfortable with the process and the understanding how the expansion works and be able to continue to move forward. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. And I know that you said at the top that you're not early on in the in the expansion, but we know that actually um, fewer than half of the states have expanded. So from our perspective, you all are pretty early adopters. Um, so, and we're appreciative of that. Um, so let's move to our um, colleagues in, in Kentucky and hear about um, how you all have um, approached really engaging the local education agencies and and the on the ground folks in schools to um, to expand. Um, so Kentucky has 171 school districts um, and about 168 are billing Medicaid for school based services. Um, and of those, only about 56 are enrolled in expanded access. Um, so we're not yet where we want to be as far as uh, as far as participation. But we are seeing tremendous growth in the program. Um, our numbers of services that have been billed um, have tripled uh, from the first year into the second year. So we are seeing that growth that we want. Um, and as far as engaging LEAs, one of the ways that we do that is through our school-based services work group. Um, it's a, a work group that is always open to membership. And currently it has representation from over 30 school districts. Um, also on that work group are other stakeholders. Um, we have um, folks from our Department of Education, Behavioral Health, Community-Based Services, Family Resource Centers, and also community partners, such as the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky and Kentucky Voices for Health. And the um, School-Based Services Work Group has monthly meetings, and it allows participants an open floor to ask questions to the Department for Medicaid Services or to the Department of Education, but also to each other. So if one school district has tried something, they can share with others that this works or it doesn't work. So it's really helpful for them to also be able to engage with each other. Um, and also earlier this year, we sent out a needs assessment survey to every single local education agency um, to identify barriers to implementation of expanded access. 
learn where they feel that they need training by including a competency self-assessment. And we wanted to gather their thoughts on how Kentucky Medicaid can best offer support and technical assistance to them. And one of the things that we learned from the survey is that often there are services being uh, delivered in the schools, even if they're not billing Medicaid. Um, so we've learned that we also need to provide guidance for them if they are delivering services in a different way. Great, thank you so much. And um, it's really um, helpful to hear about that survey because I don't know that that's something that a lot of um, states maybe have thought of doing, but it sounds like it gave you a lot of information related to what would be the most helpful to get the to get the LEAs engaged, which of course is is ultimately um, what you all want to be doing in order to um, make the program at best the best it can be. Um, so we're fortunate that we have your your education counterparts. Um, and these are folks who are at the school district level. So for those who are here and have joined us, um, you know, the, these folks are are really are really in it with their Medicaid partners and, and appreciate it. Um, so Liza and Eva, um, and we can, whoever wants to go first is welcome to. Um, can you talk about the things that have brought your district to the table? Why, why has your LEA um, come to the table and joined um, uh, in in doing this work, and what has been helpful as through the implementation of of the expanded school based um, claiming. I don't mind to to start, um, <clears throat> and so we we've, we've done a lot of advocacy work in Kentucky um, to amend the state Medicaid plan. So there were a lot of us who saw this as an opportunity to uh, see that additional services were provided in Kentucky. We had some momentum because Ken Ken Kentucky had a school shooting um, and that really um, the legislature here had a task force that was looking at um, school safety related issues. And so that led to a lot of discussion about early identification of mental health related concerns. And so that really promoted um, the option to look at expanding the state Medicaid plan um, through this expanded billing opportunities. And so um, we also are a state that's worked with our uh, partners at the Healthy School Campaign, and we also formed a state learning collaborative. And um, Erica is part of that group. We also have um, some uh, representation from local school districts, but we also have some advocacy groups as well as the Department of Education. And we're a group that meets once a week. It's actually not once a week, excuse me, once a month. Sorry, Erica. It's in addition to the group that Erica mentioned. So Medicaid has started this group of stakeholders from the across the whole state. And this learning collaborative really um, was started to look at other states and see what they were doing. And now what we do is we set goals, we look at the health needs across the state of Kentucky, and then um, we work to help identify things that are um, barriers. For example, um, <clears throat> like I'm at a vantage point, we started a um, community of practice for school nurses so we could educate school nurses on the expanded billing and uh, really try at the grassroots level to get districts engaged. One of the things in, in our own district, my district where I work, which is in um, Jefferson County, and we're a, a large district in Kentucky, which is we have some very small rural districts and, and we're the largest urban district in the state. So we've got 155 schools and nearly 100,000 students. And so um, at our district, there was much interest in um, provided this ex or being part of expanded Medicaid billing because we know that um, at the most basic level, if children aren't healthy, they don't don't learn. And so my district, was, fortunately, um, they used ESSER funding with the pandemic to place nurses in every school. And now they've committed to transition, transition that to the use of general fund. Um, and so that will actually expand what we're able to bill for. But we really have done this as um, to focus on equity because we noted such glaring health equities throughout the pandemic. And this is a way to help bridge those gaps. 
Um, again, um, we looked at the educational achievement of children who um, were missing school, for example, and we found that those with health, uh, health conditions that had been identified were more likely to be chronically absent and um, not achieving at the same level as their peers. So this really has helped to focus the work of our school nurses and um, really try and take um, a, a very data-driven look at the health needs in the district to help support the educational outcomes of students and really leverage this funding opportunity to be able to sustain having school nurses, all with the intention of maintaining uh, or supporting educational success for all kids. So it sounds like um, you're going to be one of, one of the things that I just picked up on was the addition of school nurses in the buildings um, mm -hmm. that was due to additional funding and obviously the immense amount of work that they needed to do during COVID. Um, but it sounds like that's going to be able to be maintained partly through the um, the sort of good work and the expansion um, that allows that allows some funding to come in to pay for some of those services. Absolutely. That's great to hear. It's great to hear. Um, I'm going to turn to Liza in New Mexico and hear about um, how things are um, happening for for her. Um, we've always in, in uh, my district. Um, or we've used our Medicaid funds from um, from IEPs to fund uh, about three quarters of our nurses and all of our health assistants. Um, and then COVID happened and we needed a nurse at every school because we had COVID, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's where we picked up and used the URSA funds to be able to have more health assistants, more nurses because um, as everybody knows, the nurse's office was bulging at the scenes with students with COVID symptoms. Um, I will say here in New Mexico, we are very lucky that we have our Office of School Health has an open do door policy. Um, between our quarterly meetings, um, we we also are able to call our, our state Medicaid office uh, um, daily, I, sometimes I do, um, to, to ask them questions um, about, because we have expanded um, to the free care. And so my nurses have, as being a nurse, I have jumped on board. Um, we, our nurses are doing both um, IEP services and um, expanded services, as well as our delegated uh, health providers, which are, are essentially our health assistants. Um, are doing services as well that are captured not only in our random moment time studies, but by billing. Um, so we have we have a close collaboration between um, the districts and our RECs within New Mexico and the state. And um, this year, uh, this coming year, we are expanding into our mental health um, and having our mental health, our regular ed mental health providers start billing for their uh, services and which the state has made that a whole lot easier for us because they developed all the templates for our documentation piece that is needed to um, for the for the billing of those services. So we are uh, we're rolling lot right along um, and the, with the, a lot of guidance from the state, which are we're all appreciative of. Thank you. That's helpful. And I'm just because this was as. Uh, was not part of my intro, but I was a behavioral health clinician for a long time. And so hearing that actually templates for crisis intervention, for plans of care, and for mental health progress notes, those are for non-IEP kids. And right, those are for kids who, I mean, they may also be for non-IEP kids, but I mean, for IEP kids, but those are those are forms that can be used so that, so that in in schools that the proper documentation that Medicaid would need so that if someone were to take a look, you would have everything that you needed um, from a Medicaid perspective, which is something that I know um, a lot. I bet you're going to get some emails about that particular issue because I think that there's been an, an sort of a lot of attention paid to what do we have to do to document for Medicaid? What do we have to do for, to document from an education perspective? So that's actually really helpful to hear about that collaboration um and um 
you know, it, it's it's um, really, I think, really important to have those things work both ways. One of the things that we um, that we wanted to do in the publication of the guide last May or the policy that went into it was really to highlight the fact that while um, schools are not, in fact, healthcare providers, there's a lot of service, they're education providers, there's a lot of services that can happen. And it's and that Medicaid, the state Medicaid agency can do a lot of things to facilitate that without turning the school into a clinic. And so this is a great example of something that where the where the state Medicaid agency is really supporting the work that's happening in the school. And vice versa. And we all know if a student isn't healthy, they can't learn. And mental health is just as important as our physical health. Health and nurses are on the front line of, you know, being those those people are, are those who the kids come to the nurse first. That's that's their safe zone. And so we're we're there first, and we are able to, um, you know, those psychosomatic um, symptoms that they come, and when they're coming. Continuously, we saw a lot of that, especially after the pandemic, of uh, the kids coming to the nurse's office with, "I have a stomach ache. I need to go home." You know that separation anxiety, all of those that were were um, happening at the beginning of the, um, you know, when we ease back into the schools, and so um, just having that collaboration and having those all the important um, stakeholders in in unison working for the students has has really been. Um, paramount for our district. That's great. I love I love hearing the stories of putting the kids at the center of all the grown ups and making the grown ups work work uh, uh, on behalf of on be together on behalf of the kids. That's fantastic. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, I, and this is still for my education colleagues. Um, would love to hear. There are a lot of models um, get to get services to kids in schools, so schools can bill themselves for services, but there are a lot of other models, um, even within the same LEA or even within the same school, it may be that um, uh, that there are one or two or three different models. So would love to hear a little bit about broad, sort of more broadly, the way that um, services are, are being delivered in schools. And maybe Eva, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, yeah, so we, as I said, we have about 155 or just over 155 schools in our district. So we do have a variety of models for provision of services. Um, we have some schools that have school-based health centers. So that was mentioned earlier on um, with the first panel about bringing school-based health centers into schools. And so we have a, a few schools that have that model um, in partnership with our community health centers in the area. Um, we've got some organizations that contract the district to provide mental health services. So they come into the district and um, they bill Medicaid through their agency and they provide those students, those services on site for students. And then we also have district hired staff. And um, you talked about schools aren't traditionally healthcare providers, and that's absolutely true. What we have learned in, in our district, and again, these are things that became apparent during the, the pandemic, is that even before the pandemic, we had an issue with access to healthcare, and that can be a local thing. So that's going to vary um, across um, states, across counties within states. But um, we had an issue with children having access to immunizations, as an example. And so we took a deep dive and to look at our immunization numbers and found that there just weren't places to go for students to have immunizations. Um, when we first dug into that data, we found that we had nearly one in five children in our district that weren't current on vaccines. And 92% of those were children living in poverty and 64% were children of color. So we found this significant health disparities um, among students. And so we've looked at systems with, within the community and there's a lot of those systems that are at capacity. So for example, our community health centers right now have a six month waiting period for families to, to get in to receive care. Um, our, our local um, healthcare systems, um, they limit the number of, of children that they will see that have Medicaid. And so these things all create barriers, particularly for those families that have no health insurance and those families that have 
Medicaid. So um, one of the other models we've implemented in our district is again, we've added school nurses. In Kentucky, um, nurse practitioners are able to provide primary care services. They're able to and encouraged to provide primary care services in their schools. So we are actually expanding the number of nurse practitioners that we will have in our districts with really a focus on those children that don't have anywhere else to go for services. We use those, um, those we target those children that aren't current on um, their state health requirements to be in school because those are the ones that we have discovered, first of all, aren't commiserate with their peers as far as academically. And um, they're often, again, uninsured or have Medicaid but don't have any place to go. And typically that's related to social de determinants of health. Again, with the first panel, we heard about families with transportation issues, families where parents are working two jobs, which is what's so beautiful about the community school model, because you really dig into those social determinants of health. And um, then you realize, okay, if we're going to educate these children, we have to have a system. And so our expansion of our services in schools, um, health services is hand in hand with our local health department and with a health advisory committee that we have to try and, and ensure that we've got access to care um, for kids. And billing for those services, again, helps with the sustainability. I didn't mention, but uh, again, the first panel, um, there was talk of immigrant and refugee children. And we right now have over 19,000 children who were immigrants and refugees, which has tripled since I started working with the district where we are now. We're projected to be over 20,000 next year. And um, those families have significant issues um, with access to care. Thank you so much. That's that is that's really helpful to hear about um, what you've been what you've been doing to try to get kids access where they are, which is um, in schools. Um, and Erica, do you want to talk a little bit more broadly about um, uh, things happening more broadly in Kentucky? Do you think Eva hit the models that are happening there? Um, I think she she did. We did identify from that survey that there are um, basically three models that we're seeing where the school um, hires the staff and they bill for the services. Um, the other would be that the um, school is billing for the services, but maybe contracts with an outside provider um, or the school does not bill for services and uh, contracts with an outside provider and that provider is doing the billing. And so with all of that, we see that there's a, a myriad of ways that delivery of services is occurring in the schools. And, and we did identify a need for, for more guidance. Um, the, the schools are wanting more guidance. So if they are you know, partnering with a, a CMHC, you know, how should they best go about the billing or you know, who should do the billing? And so um, with that needs assessment survey, we're, we're finding out lots of, um, lots of opportunities for more training. Right. And uh, I will say that some of those sorts of questions have also come up in the context of the TA center. Um, the um, And so there will be opportunities. And I know there are a few states getting some TA tomorrow and then later in the month. Um, but the but the TA center has also um, heard that loud and clear of sort of looking for some additional guidance, uh, particularly, I think, when there's a lot of different models. So appreciate that you're doing it there in Kentucky. And um, we will we will uh, also, I'm sure, hear more about it um, and see more things posted as as the TA Center engages. Um, Liza, I'm wondering if you can speak to um, the different models of mental health and behavioral health support specifically. Um, I know that when we had when we had um, talked, it sounds like there are there are some different ways that you all are going about that, and would love to hear more about that. Um, in our district, we are, um, we, we know we don't have enough mental health providers, um, and New Mexico in, in, in itself does not have enough, uh, uh, providers. Our, our school districts here in New Mexico, we, we, we need over 300 more providers to, mental health providers to even, um, deal with, with what we're, uh, of the mental health, uh, crisis with our students. And um, we just, we don't have them. So, what what we're utilizing, and and we have MOUs with our uh, school-based health centers, 
um, we have expanded them from the high schools down into our middle schools. And two of our um, school-based uh, health centers also take our all families um, from for our elementary students can come to our school-based health centers for mental health services as well because the, we're the need of it is so much more than we can we can handle. We also have um, our community our community uh, resources. And what we're working with right now, and because what we're seeing is more behavioral disorders versus mental health diagnoses. And so with these behavior disorders, we have contracted with two um, local agencies to bring in um, applied behavioral analysis um, uh, therapists into the classrooms um, and work with one-on-one -on -one with um, with students and uh, with behaviors, um, and that is seeming to work. We we are getting um, as this year has expanded. We are we're seeing more and more success as we go along throughout the year with doing that. Uh, we also have two um, local hospitals, and when I say local, um, one thirty minutes away and one uh, forty five minutes away. Um, that's healthcare in New Mexico. Everything's an hour away or more. Um, we also have um, MOUs with them and that so when we're in a crisis um, issue or a situation, our students um, can go to be admitted into those hospitals. We do quickly have, if they're in special education, we do an IEP so that uh, we can get them into a partial hospitalization situation and and. Our schools actually provide teachers to those two hospitals so that the kids are not only getting their mental health, but they're getting uh, core um, educational classes as well. That's great to hear. And I'm sure the continuity is critical uh, in terms of them also transitioning back to school after or they go to a partial program if they've been in crisis. So that's... And, and that's part of the deal. Well, I would say, I guess still is that they have that transition IEP and or we have that communication that when a student comes out of the hospital, whether they're in special ed or in regular education, that there is that um, communication between the hospital, the parents sign upon admission to the hospital, that that um, continuity of care can also come right back into school so that we're streamlining that continuity care and there's not a big lack of in, uh, information which um, uh, we we struggled with uh, prior to this school year of uh, uh, we didn't know what was going on in the hospital so we were trying to re restart everything and the, the student was not doing well so now that we have that continuity of care so that's seamless between the hospital and then into the schools it's been very very helpful that's that's great. That's wonderful to hear. Um, so uh, my last question, then I think we're going to go to a few audience questions. Um, a major driver of the work that we've been doing, we at CMS have been doing um, at with along with Ed and sort of the, this focus on school based Medicaid is, of course, the mental health and behavioral health crisis um, that we have that I would say the pandemic has um, uh, it, it, ha it didn't start it, but it certainly has brought it to light. Uh, and, um, I would love to hear from any, any of you, the panelists really about, um, lessons learned about providing services in schools and the way that you're using, we've heard some examples, but any additional ways that you're using, uh, Medicaid, um, reimbursement as a way to expand those services, make sure that kids are getting the services that they really, um, that they need. And, you know, at all ages, at the, the, from the littlest up to the, up to the um, adolescents. I don't know who would like to start. I don't mind to. Um, I can say that since February of this year, so we switched to a new electronic health record in our district, and um, that has been crucial with being able to communicate. Um, and since February, we've had well over 43,000 visits to our school nurses from students. 
And what we've been able to identify is that 15, almost 16% of those visits have been for headaches and 10, 10% for stomach aches. So those visits have been to school nurses. Those don't include our visits to all our other, our, all our mental health specialists in the district. And so I think one thing that's an imperative for us as we do this work is to be able to identify these conditions early when we talk about suicide prevention and things. And so we know headaches and stomach aches can be somatic symptoms of uh, potentially anxiety in particular and perhaps depression. We know that of those uh, 43,000 visits, um, excuse me, not those 43,000 visits was total. There was over 6,000 for headaches and over 4,000 for stomach aches. And of those, percent of those students were seen more than one time um, for those symptoms. And so from a nursing perspective, what school nurses can do is, is identify that this is a child that may need a referral to a mental health practitioner or even a conversation with the school counselor so that we can work on early identification and, and really help address these uh, behavioral health or mental health issues before they become problematic and interfere with the child's educational outcome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Eva. Um, my colleagues in New Mexico, Pat, do you want to talk a little bit about what's been happening there in terms of uh, what you're doing focused on mental health? Well, I'll say our nurses are our front line uh, in the school uh, for a lot of our referrals, um, especially, you know, special education they get it identified, but our regular ed students are dealing with a lot of, of, of the same issues. Um, and they do go to the nurse for that headache and for that stomach ache and, um, and or teachers referring them because they're sleeping in the classroom. And the reason that, and so we're, we're you know, and, and kids feel safe with, nurse, with nurses, you know, they, they know that we're, we're there for them. And we are doing much, much more referrals to our school counselors, um, to our special ed social workers. And, and our families are also dealing with not just, um, they, they need their basic needs. And, and some kids say, you know, I'm, I, I, I worry about, um, you know, am I gonna get breakfast in the morning? Or am I going to, you know, um, just the basic need that they, that to, to live is also a big, big um, issue that they, they put upon their own shoulders. And so I think the school nurses have, are, are there to, to intervene and get these families connected with, um, with outside agencies that can help with those basic needs. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I am going to, um, in the interest of time, I think we have time for a couple of um, questions that came from the audience. Um, and so I think um, I, I'm scrolling through because we had quite a few. Um, uh, one of the questions was how can full mental health teams, meaning a school psychologist, counselor, social worker, school nurses, all be placed at schools. No one practitioner can do it all. Um, and contracting with professionals outside of a school is not the answer. So this question of, and I don't know if um, either of my, my Medicaid colleagues um, can speak to um, kind of how the state is thinking about making sure that all of these different types of providers can, can work in the schools. In Kentucky, um, definitely um, encourage all um, all school districts and uh, Medicaid and um, education uh, folks to to review the the guidance that came out in May of last year from CMS regarding delivery of school based services and looking at what those different flexibilities are. If there are other providers that that could be billing for those services, um, especially those that aren't able to diagnose, because I think we're missing a lot of those, um, such as the school nurses, a lot of those other uh, provider types that are maybe seeing some of those issues or symptoms in the children and making sure that they're able to bill as well. Thanks, Erica. I think the other thing that's important is for the state to assess which provider types are currently billable. They need to look at their rules. They need to look at the state plan. For example, New Mexico has allowed school psychologists for many years to participate in bill on a program, but we know some states don't. And so to that extent, are there gaps in the types of providers you have available? 
and what you're currently allowing for billing purposes? And are there places where the state can make adjustments to increase that billable provider pool? That's a good, that is a good reminder. And that is definitely, um, I know something that was quite intentional in what um, the guide that is that is being referenced, that was quite intentional to broaden um, the types of providers that could bill in schools because of um, the real recognition that there are a lot of wonderful providers who are doing services in schools and wanting to make room for them. Um, and so appreciate your acknowledgement that the state Medicaid agencies may need to take a look at who they allow to bill um, and, and take advantage of some of that flexibility so that schools can, can um, you know, have school psychologists or other school providers be part of the, um, of their claiming. Um, and another question that came in, um, someone wanted to ask, this is getting a little bit into the nitty gritty, can you share some of your experience related to the staff that are engaged at the LEA level to make billing successful? So how many people might it take? That's, that specifically might be a little bit specific, but but if um, folks can talk about um, how the billing um, happens and their system um, that make that make your your um, program successful, that would be great. Um, one thing I think that's important for districts to consider. So historically, at least in Kentucky, the directors because. Um, because historically it was limited to IEPs, lots of the Medicaid coordinators in Kentucky are special ed directors. And so Erica talked about a lot of the education that's happening to make sure that districts understand who all they can bill for because uh, directors of special education might be more in tune with things related to IEPs and those services that historically could bill for, but then making sure there's an understanding of the increased services that are available. Um, Erica's team has put together a technical assistance guide for school districts that really outlines who can bill, and that's very helpful. But within our own district, uh, I, what I would encourage people to consider is when you contract with a third-party billing agent, if that's what your district decides to do, then to make sure that all the departments that are involved in that billing are at the table in those discussions, because um, if, if my background is special education, I might not understand what all of the, the nurses are doing. And so we've got lots of things in place to help streamline, like bringing the nurses to the table, at least in our district. You, you know, um, originally they were gonna have to double document and do things that was gonna really increase their workload and make make it cumbersome to try and implement expanded Medicaid billing. So everything that we can do to help make this something that doesn't increase the workload at the provider level is really important for staff to be able to do this and do this well. And then to make sure that you are working with systems that will communicate with the, uh, the platforms you already have in place rather than um, trying to, again, people to double document or to do things that are just really place a hardship on the providers. I can speak in our nursing world. We have almost um, 200 health service staff in our district. And so we um, brought somebody on to help keep up with the reporting and those things that are required. Again, we're a large district and have a lot of students, but that's a lot easier to do when you have your platforms in place on the front end to make it not create extra work for school districts. And, and that's, that's really key because most of the people in districts don't have a background in, in healthcare and Medicaid. And so you've got to have those people at the table who can speak that language. That's that's really helpful. Thank you, Eva. And and I agree. Um, certainly, the purpose of the work any of us is doing is not to add administrative burden. It's to try to take it away and make sure that that providers are spending their time, teachers are spending their time, school social workers, et cetera, doing the work with the kids, not double documenting, for instance. So appreciate that. I'm going to ask before we wrap up, I'm going to ask one more quick 
hopefully question, um, because this really is reflective of the panel, the first panel, as well as this panel, which is um, uh, uh, someone asked about, can you talk about how you're using Medicaid to support tier one and tier two school-based supports? And um, I think this speaks to the need for prevention and early intervention that happens so much in schools. And certainly at CMS, we issued some guidance back in 2022, August, um, that says that kids don't need to have a diagnosis for Medicaid billing to happen, that, that um, preventive behavioral health services are something that can be um, billed build for and provided or provided and built for. And so um, I'm wondering, uh, uh, maybe Liza, if you can speak to um, this quickly and then we will we will wrap up our panel. Um, for our tier one and tier two, um, those students um, typically, um, you know, were they way before we're at, at the, the SAP process. Um, so what we're what we're looking at is our SPED uh, providers are always available um, to provide uh, consult and, co and collaborate with the general ed uh, teachers, and um, and even with parental consent, they may screen the student uh, and or give that teacher ideas of how to work with that student. Um, this coming year, we're using a braided model. A braided model model, which is going to incorporate those regular ed students with our special education uh, mental health providers, uh, social workers, and they're going to working in those tiers as to prevent and, and lessen that load upon our special education social workers who have 60, 80 to 80 uh, student caseload and, and work on those interventions early in that tier one, tier two, so we don't have to get to that set process. And uh, so that's what we're really, really working towards in that braided model. That's great, thank you. There's so much more that could be said on that, but our time is up and I just wanted to say thank you so much um, to my Medicaid and education colleagues um, from New Mexico and Kentucky. Really appreciate you coming in and sharing your experience um, and really what came through very clearly is how much collaboration is happening in both of your states and that that is what's making the program work. So with that, I'm going to turn things back over to my colleague, Eric, from education, and um, he can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you to Kentucky and New Mexico. We are grateful that we can use your experiences to inform the work of other states. So as you can see, for those states that haven't submitted a Medicaid state plan amendment to expand Medicaid school-based services, there are many ways to customize your amendment. CMS is here to help you craft the expansion plan you feel is right for your state and schools. And CMS and Ed is here to help you with the implementation of your plan. To outline the next steps for state Medicaid agencies and state education agencies, allow me to introduce school-based services expert Richard Kimball. He serves as Technical Director and SBS SME for the Financial Management Group at the Center for Medicaid and SHIP Services. Richard, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Eric. As Eric said, I'm Richard Kimball, and I'm the Technical Director specializing in school-based services here at the Centers for Medicaid and SHIP Services. I'm part of the team at CMS that works with states to improve access to and the delivery, increasing the delivery of services in Medicaid in schools. We greatly value our continued collaboration with the Department of Education, and we want to thank both Megan and Eric, among others, for their continued outreach and work on school-based services to the various states around the country. As a federal Medicaid worker and a trained public health nurse, I greatly appreciate our panel members and all of their work in supporting childhood behavioral health and prevention. We see the key to success in increasing access and services in schools as the partnership and collaboration between state education and Medicaid agencies. These collaborations are critical to decide the structures for school-based services that will work best in each state. We encourage states to increase access for school-based services and move beyond that traditional IDEA, IEP services provided into 504 plan children and the general school population as well, as we've been hearing. As we've heard today, there is a great need for behavioral and physical health services in schools. 
Providing more access to more populations will mean better outcomes for our children. Like Secretary Cardona mentioned, children are six times more likely to engage in behavioral health services when they are offered in schools. Now, let me turn and talk a little bit more about the specific things that CMS can do for you. The state plan amendment, or what we call the SPA, is the contract between the state and us at CMS. This is the first but essential step in assuring increasing access for school-based services, not to underestimate all the other additional work that has to occur. There's a lot to implement once the SPA is approved, time studies, allocation plans, interagency agreements, and so much more. If anyone has questions about how to engage with Medicaid for these SPAs, these state plan amendments, there is help. Our Technical Assistance Center is open and is here to help and meet with states. As many of you know, the Bipartisan Safety Communities Act allowed for technical assistance. They opened up a center and we clarified school-based service policies in our new comprehensive guide, which has been mentioned here, and it was published in May of 2023. Then we opened up our Technical Assistance Center, which has been running since July of 2023. We, we are providing ongoing trainings in the form of webinars and various resource documents. We're disseminating information online and in things like FAQs. The Technical Assistance Center will continue to clarify our policies, publish resources and best practices in school-based services. Some of the webinars we've had in the past were Getting Started with Medicaid School-Based Services, Comprehensive School-Based Mental Health Systems, Understanding Rate Setting and Cost-Based Interim Payment Methodologies for Direct School-Based Services, Determining Direct Care and Administrative Services for Medicaid School-Based Services, and upcoming in April, we will present on how to bill for behavioral health services. In the future, if you have ideas, you can certainly engage with us and let us know what else would be helpful for you. The Technical Assistance Center and us can help in any state that reaches out with one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, just like we've done with New Mexico. For example, we have recently engaged on one-on-one -on -one TA sessions with states like Delaware, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, to answer their initial questions on school-based services and to help them comply with school-based services policies and following all those Medicaid regulations that can be confusing, as we know. If you're interested in technical assistance, I encourage you to reach out to us and to our Technical Assistance Center. You can send us an email or check out information on our school-based services on the Medicaid.gov website. No need to write those down, but I will mention the, the email. You'll receive an email later in the week but it's school-based services at cms.hhs.gov. I will also mention that states are required to submit any necessary changes to their state plan amendments, their time studies, their Medicaid uh, administrative claiming plans, et cetera, uh, to adhere to all applicable federal re requirements as discussed in the 2023 Comprehensive Guide as quickly as possible if any changes are needed with the exception that necessary changes may be requested and approved by July 1, 2026, is, is our deadline. We encourage states to start the submission process and the discussion between SEAs and SMAs as quickly as possible to allow for optimal time to review and make any necessary revisions. Thanks again, and please engage with us in the Technical Assistance Center. I'll now uh, hand things back to Eric to introduce our closing speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. So it's clear that to get this done swiftly, comprehensively, and correctly, it requires strong collaboration across your state government, and it requires strong intergovernmental partnerships with us at the federal level and those at the local education agency and district level. And there's no one with more experience in intergovernmental affairs and with successfully making these kind of partnerships happen than our next speaker. Please allow me to introduce White House Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, Tom Perez. You just turned it off. Hey, good afternoon. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulties. Eric, thank you for your kind introduction. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Tom Perez, and I have the privilege of serving as a 
senior advisor to the president and the director of our Office of Inter Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, a number of years ago, a few chapters ago in my life, I worked at the Department of Health and Human Services. So I got to work with all of our friends at uh, CMS and elsewhere, and it was a, a real pleasure. I'm not going to take long uh, because you've you've heard so many things. Um, I wanted to start out by saying uh, you know, I had a privilege um, a number of years ago of serving on the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured. Um, it is a, a really important nonpartisan body. We had Republicans, Democrats, Independents uh, that served on it, and our our goal in that commission was to really um, make sure that the public understood and critical um, thought leaders, decision makers, uh, governmental and non-governmental understood the power of Medicaid as a catalytic force for so many. Um, President Biden, you know, strongly believes that, you know, healthcare should be a right for all and not a privilege for a few. And we are um, so proud of the work we've been able to do, not only to expand Medicaid uh, to so many more states, but to make sure that the suite of services that are uh, provided is um, uh, up to the task of meeting the moment uh, of, of today. Um, and the moment of today, as you all know and have discussed at great length today, is a, a moment in which we have to address as a nation uh, our mental health crisis. Um, we need to build out uh, a community mental health infrastructure, um, and we need to do it especially um, to recognize the fact that um, so many young people um, have suffered uh, so much and the pandemic simply exacerbated those challenges. And that's why the president and the first lady um, have made a very strong commitment to uh, really building out a national strategy uh, in, in which we can transform how we understand, access, and treat um, mental health in America. Um, but we also know that it's not a challenge that we can solve on our own uh, in government. Uh, we all must be in uh, this enterprise together. Um, that's why we've been working with um, um, educators, youth advocates, um, so many people. And I want to thank um, the Secretary of Education uh, for uh, convening this because Secretary Cardona's leadership has been indispensable in shining a light on the youth mental health crisis. And, and similarly, um, my good friend, Secretary Becerra, uh, has been really leading the charge over at HHS. Um, and we just have to make sure we continue this work. And I, I, the reason I mentioned the Kaiser Commission is one of the things I learned a long time ago about Medicaid is it can be so transformative. And, and um, your imagination, in many cases, is simply the, the only limit of what we can do. I've seen so many um, remarkably innovative things that states have done uh, through 1115 waivers, through other means to um, help address various challenges uh, like the social determinants of health. Um, and uh, in the mental health crisis, there are significant challenges um, and opportunities that the Medicaid program uh, can really bring to bear as um, as a, a critical tool for you moving forward. Um, I mean, our, our young kids, um, I'm a firm believer that uh, everybody is gifted and talented, and it's up to us to draw out those gifts and talents. But we need to recognize the reality that while we hope that zip code never determines destiny in all too many corners of our country, that's exactly what's happening. People aren't getting a fair shake. I have a very ambivalent relationship with the term second chance because it implies that people had a fair good had a fair good chance, their first chance. And um, and in so many cases, uh, they haven't. And and that and they haven't because we haven't addressed uh, the mental health crisis in a sufficiently holistic way. And we know and you know, because the studies are legion, that investing in kids mental health today will pay dividends down the road for students, their families. Um, the communities for um, everything we need to do um, as a nation uh, to build this out. So um, I, I'm really here to say, um, please um, make sure you follow the lead. And I want to say thank you to those 13 states 
um, who have expanded, fully expanded their state Medicaid plans to allow for schools to receive reimbursement for school-based health and mental health services. Um, I think that is remarkable. And there's three more states that have partially expanded their plans to allow for schools to receive uh, that reimbursement. Um, that is just an indispensable part of um, how we're going to move forward. Uh, Justice Brandeis famously said that uh, states are laboratories of democracy. We have an Affordable Care Act today because one state uh, got ahead of the curve and, uh, and did it, and the country followed suit. And while we know that uh, initially there was skepticism about the long-term viability of the uh, Affordable Care Act, look today and you've got um, 21 million people enrolled. That's a really big deal. Um, president Biden and the first lady and the vice president, you know, they, they imagine a world in which every single state has a robust community mental health infrastructure and an infrastructure that has as one of its anchors, um, schools in which, uh, we meet kids where they are. We provide the necessary and holistic services that can enable them to realize their full potential. Uh, some people say we can't afford to do this. And I know if I, the president were here, he would say, we can't afford not to. And that's why today's and tomorrow's, uh, these convenings are so critically important. You are all those uh, incubators of innovation. And I want to say thank you on behalf of the president for all that you're doing. And I want to make sure you know that um, we here at the White House, whether it's myself or my colleague, Nir Tandon, who heads up the Domestic Policy Council, um, everybody here is all in. And so if you have questions, uh, obviously um, HHS is one place to go, the Department of Education is another, but you should know that you not only have um, friends here at the White House, uh, we are going to continue uh, to do everything in our power to ensure that we can address this crisis that we can build upon the success that we've seen in many of the states that have already um, innovated and taken advantage of um, the Medicaid system to reform their um, youth mental health system and make sure that there are school-based health and mental health services available. So thank you so much. Time is indeed of the essence. Um, too many people, uh, too many young people um, are, are suffering in silence. We know we can help them. We know so much of what works and let's take it to scale. And that's exactly what you've been doing. So thank you so much, um, Eric, and uh, everybody who has hosted us today. It's an honor to be with you and it's inspiring to see what you're doing day in and day out. Thanks so much. Thank you, Director Perez. We appreciate your leadership. Well, folks, you heard it. You can act now by bringing together your state agencies to utilize Medicaid school-based services in the way that best supports children's mental health in schools. Many states on this call will soon have meetings with our joint Ed and CMS Technical Assistance Center, and we are so excited to help you in this process. If you and your state leaders haven't connected with the TA Center yet, please email them at schoolbasedservices at cms.hhs. Dot gov, G -O -V. Again, that's school-based services at cms.hhs.gov. TA Center staff are ready to help. As we close out our event today, I want to thank our speakers, our events team, and I want to give spe special recognition to two people devoted to this work. Megan Whitaker, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, and Amanda Delgaitis, Special Advisor for State and Local Outreach in Secretary Cardona's office. I also want to thank each and every one of you for attending today's event and using the information and stories heard here today. Let's leave here with Secretary Cardona's words in mind. Children's lives are on the line. So use your power to raise the bar for children's mental health. Thank you.